to guard, direct, and comfort. Bridge Bailey bridges to connect up highways and streets, and thus end the isolation of scores of cities and towns. The Bailey Bridge is like a king-sized director set. A well-trained crew can assemble and launch one across a 100-foot stream in two and one-quarter hours. And it will carry from 28 tons to 60 tons, depending upon its type. The Bailey is a Corps of Engineers item. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of them, were set up during war by crack combat engineer teams to span the Rhine, the Volturno, the Rapido, and the steep gullies of Korea. As fast as a Bailey was completed, supply and work vehicles of reconstruction moved across. Emergency repair of public utilities was a desperate need. One of the responsibilities of the Army engineers is the immediate restoration of sewers and water mains. President Eisenhower made a personal survey of the devastated region. He saw for himself the extent of the loss and suffering. Shocked, the president declared the entire flood zone a disaster area. He called upon the Federal Civil Defense Administration through its administrator, Val Peterson, to bring relief to the people of the stricken region. Administrator Peterson not only set his own national organization to work, he also delegated to the Army's Corps of Engineers the duty of carrying out the reconstruction phase of the president's disaster order. And Operation Noah was born. The Army Corps of Engineers has a unique organization in being which covers the entire United States in 10 separate division areas, each in charge of a division engineer and each divided into districts where required. An emergency in any part of the country along any river system at an important harbor or huge metropolitan target thus could be met and promptly handled by the engineer division and district heads acting under direction of the chief of engineers in Washington. Simultaneously, the chief may alert the entire nationwide organization and dispatch reinforcements to the disaster area. By congressional statute, the Corps is responsible for national flood control. So when the northeastern states were also declared a disaster area, the North Atlantic and New England divisions became a quickly organized scene of battle against not only flood, but also disaster havoc. The Chief of Engineers, Lieutenant General Samuel D. Sturgis, Jr. at Washington, telephoned his commands to the North Atlantic Division Chief at New York and the New England Division Chief at Boston. To the disaster area, he dispatched 49 engineer officers by plane from Fort Belvoir, the Engineer School and Training Center. And to help handle the added duty of disaster relief, 100 of the Corps civilian engineers were flown in from division and district headquarters in the Middle West and Far West. More than 50 field offices were immediately set up in the disaster area. After thus mobilizing his forces and deploying them in the flood zone, General Sturgis promptly flew to the scene. He was accompanied by his operations chief, director of field activities for Operation Noah. By flying low, he could study the extent. General Sturgis saw that destruction in the region, while greater in extent than elsewhere, only repeated the pattern of loss and wreckage. Operating directly from their field offices, Army engineers continued to work round the clock. Throughout the disaster area, local contractors had been given immediate assignments. More than 500 contracts were spot negotiated for sums running to many millions of dollars. Engineers checked the work as it proceeded.
Each type of equipment had its special use, and all types were employed in this vast labor of repair and restoration. At the forks of the Lehigh and the Delaware, where the flood crested shortly after midnight, August 19th, debris piled against the Northampton Bridge, damming the deluge momentarily. Then the million-ton force of the flood burst through. That was the story for scores of bridges. The clock was stopped later in the morning of August 19th by the watery fingers of Connecticut's Naugatuck River. All Connecticut was in the major disaster area. Down the Naugatuck came the towering wall of water which contributed so greatly to the state's toll of death and damage. The raging river picked up rocks and rubble and flung them everywhere. A measure of the flood's power, heavy railroad rails bent and twisted by the force of waterborne debris thrust against them with a giant strength. And boxcars lifted up and smashed against nearby buildings. Railroad yards giving access to the flood area. Trucks were waiting to haul the bridges to the road end. Food contamination and its threat of disease germs and insect carriers was a menace handled by civil defense workers. Restoration of the normal flow of community life went on rapidly. The flood had coursed through this street and store, leaving eight feet of rock and rubble. In clearing away, Repairing and restoring, many thousands of workmen, jobless through Diane, found temporary employment and take-home pay, thus tending to maintain the economy of the region on a self-help level. As you look over the scenes of vast desolation, you ask yourself, is this a first time for these cities and peoples? This tragic story of flood and devastation and death? Has it ever happened before? One million of it, and the Army engineers built this flood wall, which in 1955 saved the city twice its cost in property damage alone. Under the same authorization, this flood control dam was built on the Westfield River, a tributary of the Connecticut. During Diane, it largely controlled the Westfield and diminished flood stages along the entire Connecticut. As part of the same offering, this dam was constructed above Willimantic. In the Great Diane Storm, it reduced flood stages there and downstream on the Chetucket and Thames Rivers. These dams stand dry until a record downpour threatens. Then the control gates are closed and the reservoirs fill with billions of gallons which otherwise would pour into the swollen streams and build them to raging floods. With the emergency passed, the gates are opened and the impounded waters drain away. Man's memory is so short. Only one-sixth of the offered $300 million has taken form in flood control works. Yet the unbuilt dams and levees would have reduced to a minimum the damage from even such a flood as Diane, unprecedented in extent and fury. So the plans for watershed development, which would help to contain flood waters, 
and save the cities and peoples from destruction and death remained largely uncompleted. As in unprotected New England and the North Atlantic states, there are many regions in our nation with floods as frequent and as uncontrolled. Must man's memory continue to be so short?